So we're going to be doing a lot of work with blueprints over the course of this tutorial series. And I think it makes sense to cover some of the basics that are kind of common throughout all of the blueprints. We're going to create a very standard blueprint here by right clicking in the content browser and selecting blueprint class. And then we're going to select actor. I'm going to call this one blueprint actor demo. Go ahead and save it and open it up. So it's going to start with a viewport. This is if you have any geometry or anything happening, you can see what that'll look like. If I drag this into the world, there's our little circle thing, our default scene route. It's the same thing as what's in here. If I wanted to add a piece of geometry, uh, like a sphere, you can see there's that sphere. I can move the sphere and it'll update in real time. I don't really want to put a sphere in here just quite yet though. So anything that we want to add to the blueprint is going to be added here in the component section. You can add things manually or procedurally, and I'll show you that in a moment. We have our graphs. This is the event graph. So the event graph we'll talk about here in just a second. Any functions that you want to add, probably not going to talk too much about functions initially other than the construction script, but we will get to this a little bit later on. And then any variables that we might want to have in our blueprint. This we're definitely going to talk about. So if I go to my construction script, the idea here is you see this little yellow question mark button. I need to compile this blueprint because I added the sphere and then I deleted it. And so it's in a state where it doesn't know if it's valid. So when I hit compile, it's going to check all of the logic that I have in there and then also fire off the construction script. So the idea here is if you want something to run one time on compile, then you want to attach it to the construction script. If you want it to be some kind of repeatable function that you can call or an event that you can call, then you want to put it in the event graph. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So what I'm going to do, having attached a print string node to my construction script, is I'm going to hit compile. And we can see we're getting a whole bunch of hellos there because that's what we're telling this thing to print, right? So I'm actually going to modify this so that it says construction script. Compile again, right? Okay, hopefully that's clear. So now I'm gonna head over to the event graph. By default, there are gonna be three events uh, that, that exist but don't have anything attached to them, so they're kind of blurred out or grayed out or whatever. The first one is event begin play. This is going to be fired off whenever you hit this little green arrow up here. The next one is going to be actor begin overlap. So if like you create some collision or something, you can have that fire off this event. Like if the player were to approach a door and you want the light to turn on or something, then that's where you would set this up. And then event tick is going to be like a bazillion times a second. It's going to be checking stuff. So this is expensive and you typically only want to do it when you really need to do it. So for now, I'm not really going to use either of these. I'm just going to go ahead and delete them. And we're going to hang out with the event we can play for a second. I'm going to go ahead and pull off of the execution pin and type in print. And what I want to print is going to be begin play. So we'll compile. You'll notice our construction script is run, but not our event begin play. But when I hit play, that's where we're going to get our begin play. And you can see that one only gets called one time. I'm not sure why the construction script is getting pinged so many times, but anyway. Okay, so that is the difference between the construction script and event begin play very broadly. We can add a custom event. So I'm going to add a custom event by typing in custom. By the way, just right clicking out here in this uh, empty space and then type in custom will give me the ability to grab a custom event. I'm going to call this one add spheres. And we'll just go ahead and make another print node for now. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to call this from the details panel, which you can do very easily. I'm going to go ahead and select the new event, give myself a little bit of space here in the details panel. If you don't see this, I think you probably just go to window and then details is here at the top. There's this uh, toggle here for call an editor. I'm going to turn that on. We will compile again. And now if I scoot this out of the way and select my blueprint, now I have a button here called add spheres. And if I press it, I get the printout add spheres. So the idea here is you can have kind of complicated stuff happening in your blueprint logic, but then somebody, let's say a designer or somebody who's not familiar an environment or something not familiar with the, the logic that you've set up, they can still access that functionality by stuff that you expose here in the details panel. So rather than printing 
spheres. What I want to do is I want to create some spheres randomly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a little bit of logic that will fill this space up here with randomly generated spheres. Whenever you want to repeat a series of steps, the node that you want to use is called a for loop. And it'll be located down here. And what's going on here is this is basically the counter, right? So if I set this to 100, what this is going to do is each time I run through this, it's going to increment the counter by one. And as soon as the counter equals the last index, it'll basically either be done or it'll fire off the completed pin if you have anything attached to that. So let's go ahead and compile there. I'm going to disconnect that. We don't need it anymore to demonstrate the difference. Off of a loop body, now what I want to do is I want to print. And the thing that I'm going to print is the index. So if I pull off of the index and pipe it into the in string, we're going to get a little bit of a conversion here, which is going to convert it from an integer, which is a whole number, to a string, which is a word. And again, this is connected to my add spheres event. So I don't need to be in play for this. I can do it directly here in the editor, uh, not in Pi. So you can see now we're printing all of the integers as we pass through our for loop. So I'll do that one more time. Right, it's pretty quick. And it's not showing all of them, obviously, because we're, we're truncating that list. But So that is how a for loop works. Let's go ahead and get rid of this. What I'd rather do here is I'd rather spawn an actor of class. So I'm going to type in spawn, and pretty quickly it figures out what I'm looking for. I have to tell it a few things. I have to tell it the transform, which is the location of the object, and I have to tell it what kind of class it's going to be. So this is going to be a static mesh actor. You can see down there, that's my static mesh actor. And then I'll generate the spawn here in just a second. But the static mesh actor doesn't by default know what its static mesh is going to be. It's a, sort of an empty container. And I'll show, you, I'll show you what I mean by that. So I'm just going to hop over to the modeling menu for a second, and we'll create a sphere, and we'll hit accept. So if I, this is now a static mesh actor. You can see over there in the type, it's labeled static mesh actor, and it has a static mesh in the details panel. If I clear this, I still have a static mesh. It just doesn't have a static mesh. Sorry, I still have a static mesh actor. It just doesn't have a static mesh assigned. So we need to assign our static mesh, and we'll just actually use this sphere here. That'll work out well. So another kind of, kind of important thing about working with blueprints is understanding what these colored circles mean. Each color is indicative of the kind of data that, uh, that this is expecting. So it's, when it's a, this kind of lovely minty green, it's an integer. If it is a bright green, it's a float, which is a decimal point number. So these are all integers because these are whole numbers. These we're using this as our counting. This orange circle here is going to be a transform. Transform is location, rotation, and scale all kind of packed into one data object. This purple thing is class. And then this blue circle here, you can see one there as well. That's basically a, a wild card for any Unreal object. So, and you can mouse over and it'll tell you what it is. So in this case, it's a static mesh actor object reference. And we told it what kind of class we're going to be creating. So now that it is a static mesh actor object reference, anything that you can do to a static mesh, you can now sort of pull off and access here in this dropdown. Now, this is a very large dropdown, and there's tons of stuff in here, and very little of it is actually relevant to what we're looking for. So you have to do a little bit of poking around, and, and the more you do it, the more comfortable and easy this process gets. But you can see here I've got this context-sensitive checked on. That means I'm only going to have access to functionality that is available on whatever the object here is that I pulled off on. If you turn this off, you're going to get like every single function available on every object in the game, and that's typically not what you want. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to type in static mesh. And you can see right here at the top, I have set static mesh, and it's got the static mesh component here in parentheses. And that just means there is a static mesh component object that is associated with our static mesh actor, and the static mesh component is what owns our set static mesh functionality. So now I can set the static mesh. I just have to tell it what is the static mesh that I want. So I'll select the sphere that we made here and click this little button there to apply it. So we're getting a problem, and the problem is it wants to know what is our spawn transform. So let's go ahead and figure that out. And I think probably if you click on the error, 
uh, it'll tell you there's compiler results, right? So like it wants to spawn transform. It says this pin is invalid and it doesn't know where to spawn the actor. So the whole thing kind of breaks down. See our little compile here has now got this uh, sad face on it. So I'm gonna pull off from spawn transform and I'm gonna type in make transform down here at the bottom. And we're a little bit over time, so I'm just gonna leave it where it is. So they will all be spawning directly at 000. So we'll go ahead and save it. And I think, well, I think 000 is gonna be one of these corners here, but let's go ahead and just run this code. So I'll select my blueprint and we'll hit add spheres. And you can see, I now have a whole bunch of static mesh actors that are sitting over here at 000 in the world. So in the next video, we'll talk about a few more things that you can do in terms of creating some random values for these. So they're floating around and then we're ultimately going to want to like delete these and clean them up. So we'll, we'll run through a few different scenarios for, for how to go about that. So stick around.